Um, the short name of the project in which this is happening is um, Advice on Harmonized Wine Regulations. So this is uh, to support the, um, the participating states, which is Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia, um, within their process of aligning their wine regulations with EU. So that is within EU accession process. And yes, due to COVID-19, of course, we had to adapt some of our um, project activities and that made it possible that we are also talking about some um, some topics which are not directly linked to the wine regulation process and which made available this um, um, this date for the digital experimental fields of the BMEL which are very interesting projects and we are really happy that we can um, we can show them today to a broader audience. In total, four projects will present their work in the area of uh, research and digitalization in viticulture and wine. And we start with the first presentation by Dr. Anna Kicherer of the Julius Kühn Institute, which is the Federal Research Institute for Plants in Germany. And she's, of course, working in the Wine Breeding Institute. And yes, I would suggest um, that we do the presentations one by one. And in between, there will be time for you to ask questions and to discuss. And then in the end, we also have some time uh, left over for a broader discussion, if you like. So first of all, um, Dr. Kichera, the stage is yours. And yes, you can share your screen. OK, thanks a lot for the introduction. And I hope everybody can see my screen and slides so that we can um, start. So um, I'm very happy that we are able to uh, to present our digital fields today. Uh, me, myself, I'm uh, coordinating uh, the experimental field called Digivine. And um, as I'm the first speaker today, I have the chance to introduce you to our experimental fields that are um, spread all over Germany. So you can see on a map here, um, we have different uh, experimental fields. Uh, some deal with plant production, some with animal farming, and some have multidisciplinary um, approaches. The 14 experimental fields in total are funded by the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture with 50 million euros over three years. And uh, well, the aims are improving and um, developing uh, digital techni techniques uh, for plant production and animal farming and to test these uh, methods directly in agriculture. Um, overall, you could say that uh, digitalization in agriculture is very, uh, very important uh, for reliable harvests, for efficient food production, and um, of course for more animal uh, welfare. Um, and um, other goals are uh, more environmental protection and more efficient use of resources and the reduction of workload for the farmers. Um, to an overall, to an overall um, goal to secure our agricultural jobs and to make them attractive for the future. Of course, these guys are producing our livelihood and we should support them as uh, much as possible. So that brings me to our aims. What are the aims in, in DigiVine? Uh, well, that's, these are the four projects you will hear of today. And I am starting with DigiVine right here in the south of Germany. So what are we doing? We are looking into the potential of digitalization from planting um, to grape delivery. So within the network of grape wine. And uh, the first task we are working on is the planting. So planting of new vineyards um, in combination with the GPS information that is uh, gained uh, in, the, in the process. And so far this uh, GPS position is not used for any other task. Um, and in this uh, project, um, we deal a lot, of, uh, a lot with um, different interfaces. And one is to bring this information into farm management systems, for example, and use it in the other tasks following. So the second task we are looking at is root planning um, to give the, the wine grower or the wine um, a tool to navigate through vineyards, for example. So you could say it's a Google Maps for viticulture. And um, the third task uh, that we are looking into is plant protection, another very important point in grapevine. And we have got two different topics here. One is the protection of non-target areas, and I will talk about that a little bit, a little bit um, uh, later on. And the other task is to optimize the application technique and plant protection, also to reduce uh, plant protection um, 
liquids, for example. Um, and the fourth big part we are looking into is yield and quality. There we are observing different sensors um, to do non-destructive measurement of ripening, for example. But I will not go into that topic today. But if you are interested, we can discuss that later on, of course. Um, so there are uh, different uh, digital methods already and techniques already available in grape wine. For example, we have disease prognosis models that uh, wine growers can use to get the right time for their plant protection, for example. Or we have different sensors on agriculture machines um, to, uh, that, that are used for guidance, for example, in harvest machines. Um, and there is a big thing uh, with the farm management systems that are available on the market, which can be very helpful and which work obviously digital because they are mostly browser um, browser based or you can use them in their mobile phones. And I would like to go a bit into the farm management systems. So what do farm management systems offer? Uh, for once, they offer a, man a, a possibility to manage um, the vineyards. So to to get um, to get all your plots together, we as as wine growers, especially in Germany, we have lots of plots that are divided over a large area. So it is uh, very good if you can like manage them over one tool and don't have to do it manually. Um, then there is a possibility if you have the right interfaces and if the interfaces are existing, and that is another part we are working in in the project, um, that uh, that you can integrate many types of data and machines, for example. Um, also, the coordination of different processes within the vineyard or the cellar are an important task that can be uh, solved through um, farm management systems. And there is also a big uh, point in documentation, planning and analysis of such things. So if it is so processes or your um, documentation for plant protection, for example, um, some, some legal regulations, but I think um, the last talk will be more detailed for that, uh, for that point. And to mention the two um, farm management systems that we are working together in that project, it's uh, Vineyard Cloud and the Geoinformationsdienst uh, GID. Um, these are the two farm management systems that we are uh, collaborating in, in Digivine, but there are some more out there. Um, so for whom can the farm management or, or who can use the farm management systems? For once it is the wine grower himself, um, even, um, no matter if he is, has his own winery or if he's a cooperative member. And then uh, the second thing is the winemaker, um, either in a cooperative or in big cellars. And then in Germany, we have lots of um, contractors, so people who do, for example, machine harvest uh, for the wine grower. So these guys could also use farm management systems to organize their um, whole process of, uh, of, of ordering them and also of um, yeah, the whole, the whole go through process. Um, then there is us, the institutions, so research institutes and universities that also have lots of vineyard plots uh, on them on their cell on their own on their own um, area, uh, which need to be um, managed. But sometimes we have some some other questions than um, than the wine growers. So in the in our case, that needs some specification of the farm management systems to use them. And then um, there's always the question, um, how is the value delivered to the different stakeholders I just mentioned? And therefore I borrowed a slide from our uh, collaboratives uh, from Vineyard Cloud, because I think they, they really nice illustrated that there are different stakeholders that can use farm management system, but that each of them has got their, each, uh, their, their own interests and data that are important to them. And there's also a, a kind of network. So some data is used by both the contractor and the wine producer or the institutes and the wine producer. And um, that illustrates it very nicely here. Um, for me, there is uh, one thing missing and that is machines because machines also deliver, um, deliver good data or valuable data that could be used in farm management systems. And today I will um, come up with one, uh, with one example uh, when we talk about plant protection, which um, well is somehow situated in that area here. Because as I said, we are looking into two different uh, 
topics in plant protection. One is the protection of non-target areas, and that is the one I would like to go through with you today. So if we look at that uh, picture of a vineyard, which is just close by our institute, um, you can see that there are different non-target areas that need to be protected from plant protection. For example, the hatches over here or the single tree and tree rows in the back. And then there's uh, in each valley or in a lot of valleys around here, there is water bodies and embankments uh, that need to be protected. And um, the stationary regulations um, are need to be followed by the vine grower on its on its own. So um, so far there is no de no decision a support tool or a control mechanism available um, for the vine grower, and that's where we we set um, our point with Digivine because we want to um, improve that and gain a mechanism that helps the vine grower to follow the regulations. Um, so, what are the existing data sources in Germany? We have um, different data sources that all include woody parts, but not extensively Germany-wide. So, the only the only data source that we have is ATKIS, which is extensively German-wide, but it only has real woody elements and no linear structures like hedges or tree rows. And then there are three others, but they are not extensively German wide, so that's only in few regions. And as you can see, it's always different parts of the of wood wooden areas that are marked and are known, but not all of it. So you can say there's no nationwide and complete data available on non-target areas like hedges and water bodies. And well, our goal in Digivine is um, to improve this data. Um, for example, by additional uh, geo and earth observation data. So that can either be uh, multispectral data or um, GIS secondary data. So uh, that would be, for example, a phenological stage of the grapevine. Or uh, the third thing is a LIDAR data. So that would be laser data that can be used. Um, and that's the one we are using in the project. And the goals would be to get a better distribution and completeness of the non-target areas and um, to increase quality parameters like length, height, height and structure or heterogeneity of the, of the non-target areas. So as I said, we are in the project using LIDAR data and the big goal is uh, to adapt plant protection um, towards uh, this target or non-target areas. So how do we achieve that? Um, the first thing you need is LIDAR data and to quickly um, go into the process how LIDAR principle works. So you can either use uh, LIDAR data from satellites or from planes. And in our case, we used LIDAR data from planes. So the, the picture on the right side just uh, quickly shows how it works. So there is a laser sent, light sent out, and it is reflected either by ground or by the trees and structure that we are looking for and the reflection is measured. And um, from that, we get a, a card like an absolute height above sea level, so a digital terrain model. And um, that not only goes for the ground, but also for the structure. So this would be the, the trees or anything that is higher than the, the ground level, so the structure. And um, in this model, we know for each point if there is a structure and how high it is. And that could be visualized by this. So here the farmland is grayed out and only the aerial picture is shown for the farmland and the terrain volumes are uh, minus the structure, so the outermost points of the structure and therefore you get the height of vegetation uh, which is now colored, um, color vis visualized and you can see it's between uh, 0 and 15 meter high. And um, yeah, therefore you get like a more three-dimensional veg vegetation structure uh, with uh, not only the height, but also the density, the volume, the structure, the hedge type. And um, up to now, the only thing that we are analyzing is the height because that's the easiest um, value to analyze. But in the future, it is possible to, uh, to do more complex analysis, uh, for example, density. So if there is a higher re reflection, it means that the, the, the hedges are very dense. And um, yeah, that could be used to, for example, the LIE um, and uh, instruct information on biodiversity or thrift possibility of plant protection. And um, yeah, what are we doing to, um, to implement this service in Digivine? So the goal is uh, to set up a web service 
um, uh, like a kind of digi digi wine uh, field view, which is already existing. Um, and in that service, you can on the fly detect your three dimensional three dimensional uh, vegetation structure from LIDAR data. So that works. Uh, well, you go on the website and um, you would choose your your area that you are looking or that you are interested in, and then the vegetation vegetation structures uh, within a 15 50 meter meter radius um, could be de di directly uh, detected online, um, and that. On the other hand, could be used uh, by farm management systems or, for example, for farm machine firms. And it's not only a 2D map, but you can also do a 3D visualization of the zone. So you see uh, right now the, the agriculture area is out in black and you only see the non-target areas around the area that is sprayed. Um, yeah, so uh, we are currently working, oh, well, my colleagues uh, are doing this. Uh, they are currently working on it so that you can also visualize the wines themselves, not only the vegetation around. Um, and that could be very helpful in case of uh, plant protection application. So if you know what your canopy and your vineyard looks like, it's, uh, it's even possible to do plant protection right there where the canopy exists. And that brings me to the to the point of application and possibilities how this uh, this kind of uh, thing could be implemented in viticulture. Um, so on the one hand, we have now that web service uh, that gives you an information about the vegetation structure. Um, in in actual at at the moment, it's the non-target areas that needs to be saved. And um, another task that we look at in the project, also in the plant protection section, is um, the plant protection application. And uh, other colleague in from the JKI is looking into um, how we could detect gaps in canopies, because in vineyards we often have uh, not, not really dense canopies, so there could be wines that, uh, that have no leaves, for example. And right now, up to now, the technique is not able to stop uh, the spraying for the gaps in the canopy. And uh, the idea is to use also LIDAR sensors to detect these gaps and then um, uh, turn off the, the chats at that point so that you can save um, uh, plant protection. And also the, the technique of the application uh, can be improved, uh, for example, the chats and the use, uh, usage of uh, spraying material. And the big goal here is uh, to uh, get a situation adapted plant protection in place. Uh, and that is like one of the big goals that we are heading for in Digivine. Yeah, so that has been uh, two examples uh, that we are working on at the project right now, and I hope I could have given you a little insight into the into the experimental field. And that brings me already to the end. So I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions left, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Anna Kichara, I think it was a really nice presentation and also feeding into many of the sustainability goals that we have on a global, on the EU and also national level. So the floor is open for questions. If, if you like to ask a question, you can raise your hand, but also go straight ahead in case you do not know where this function is in MS Teams, or you can also type it into the chat if you like. Maybe right now everybody is still overwhelmed by what you're doing at DigiWine. <laughs> but in that case, I would say we go ahead. Or is there some question in the audience? I do Anna, not... Anna um, this is Uli Fischer from Neustadt. I have one question. If you look at the height of your uh, uh, trellising system and your plants, would it be possible to use it also to um, steer the irrigation, because when you have irrigation, maybe in one or the other rows, and you can see these two rows are much lower in the hedging, or much lower in the growth, that you can increase the irrigation there. So could this be a possible feedback in the future? 
Um, very interesting question. I think the point is that the LIDAR data that we are using as a base is only acquired once and not regularly. So that would be a point if we get regular data on the on the observation area, that would be possible, I think. But uh, as we are getting only as we are doing the analysis with the with the LIDAR sensor only once, it is difficult to say whether uh, whether it um, has an impact on the irrigation or not. But if you have a steady um, a steady sensor that takes like I don't know each week for example data that would be interesting to look in yeah thanks for the question anything else from the audience this is your chance it's not so often that you get to grasp these experts on the experimental fields Okay, if not, I suggest that we move on. And the next presentation is on the experimental field DivaCopter, and it is um, it is um, organized by our cooperation partner in the Western Balkans project, which is Hochschule Geisenheim University. And I welcome Dr. David Brunov from the Department of Viticultural Engineering to give his presentation. So, welcome. Can you see uh, my presentation? Yes. And can you see the mouse? Yes, that as well. Okay, this is good. Okay, so a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, I'm happy to be able to, to present a little bit what we're doing here. As uh, you have said, uh, it won't be necessary to present the Hochschule Geisenheim um, because it's already known as a project partner. And the experimental field DivaCopter, um, the application was done by the by three departments of the Hochschule Geisenheim. It is the Department of Viticultural Engineering. This is where I am working, and as well as the, the uh, and also the Department of General and Organic Viticulture, and the Department of Wine and Beverage Business. I'll give you a short uh, introduction. Divacopter, uh, what is covered by Divacopter, and um, give some examples of activities we do before I will uh, close with a short conclusion. So the, abri abri ab the acronym of uh, Divacopter you can see here is a digitalization in viticulture. Here we have a, a V in, in, uh, for Weinbau in, in the German uh, in, and agriculture with focus and possible use of multicopters. Um, test areas are provided by the Hochschule Geisenheim and by the Hessische Staats Staatsweingüter in Eberbach and by the Zwei Lindenhof Reim in Hohenstein. The project is a quite uh, um, multidimensional project. I've tried to symbolize it here with uh, some, some uh, uh, slides. Um, there is one dimension. Um, the different crops which uh, will be covered. The first, first of all, it's uh, the, the vertical crop, the viticulture. This is the main topic, but it will be extended to uh, another vertical crop, uh, meaning orchards. Um, but it will also be extended to arable crops, uh, meaning wheat and canola. The next dimension, uh, we are working not only on different crops, but working on different uh, levels of sensors. There is one level, uh, I call it not completely exactly a kind of linear or time row sensors. So this is, uh, for example, uh, temperature sensors or humidity sensors or speed sensors, all sensors um, which result in, in line graphs if you plot them. The next level of sensors are kind of um, aerial, it's not, not correctly written here, I mean the area, not the air, um, uh, kind of 2 or 2.5D sensors um, resulting from RGB and multispectral cameras. So if you take one photo, you get a two-dimensional uh, sensor result. And if you have um, several channels, you get uh, even a kind of 2.5 uh, result because you have several layers of this two-dimensional area. And there will be a, a third um, uh, dimension of, th uh, of sensors, which uh, are, I will call here sp spatial sensors. Um, the result of these uh, sensors are 3D point clouds 
which um, are the, the result of uh, photogrammetric processes or of LiDAR scans. So if you put those two dimensions together, you have the, the two you have you have two dimensions uh, re represent. To go into the third dimension, we have uh, another aspect. Um, this is data transmission. On the on the first um, layer, we have uh, local data transmission techniques like VLAN or LoRaWAN. I will explain uh, that furthermore. Um, in the next level, we have kind of terrestrial uh, data transmission systems like internet or uh, mobile networks. And uh, this is a new thing for us here. Um, in the third level, uh, we um, make trials with uh, satellite communication. Um, the, there is a um, one point ir iridium satellites, which are low elevation orbit satellites. They are uh, turning around the Earth and geo uh, satellites like Astra, which are geostationary satellites. And uh, the background is uh, there's a lot of discussion about the, the mobile nets not everywhere available. Um, not sure when will 5G uh, mobile nets be available everywhere. And so this could be a solution to fill the gaps. So and there is even a, a kind of fourth dimension. Uh, so you, you see that we have the cube of these first three dimensions. And the fourth dimension are the target groups. So the things we do um, aim to the needs of producers. So we cover, cover uh, sub subjects of plant protection and fertilization, also of uh, crop management and documentation. These are all aspects uh, which are interesting for producers. There's another target group, I call it services. So these are consulting services, which also need documentation, documentation uh, aspects. And uh, um, we're working with drones and big drones, which probably will be uh, uh, driven by by service um, by services, uh, which would like to to work with those drones um, beyond visual line of sight. Um, so we have the the radio links therefore. And the third target group is uh, consumers, which are interested or might be interested in retraceability. Uh, really, which is related to documentation and, and additional information about the product they, they want to buy. So this is the, the general structure of the, of the experimental field. And I'll dive into some um, activities. And now you can imagine, uh, or you can for yourself uh, imagine where on the cube um, which activity is, is lying in. One activity is um, concerning sensor networks. Here you have a basic structure of the sensor network. These are uh, especially the, the linear sensors, like a temperature sensor, rain sensor, or sun, sun radiation sensors, leaf witness sensors, but also actu actuators, for example, waves or pumps for irrigation systems. And it's a specialty of um, what is special about these sensors is uh, they are um, have a real uh, low power consumption. So there is a small battery inside which um, is enduring uh, several months or even years. Um, and they have a, a, a long range communication. So compared to the small uh, energy they they need, they have a, a, a long uh, long range to for, with the radio link. This is made because they only send their data for very short moments and then have uh, um, uh, then, then they are silent for for some time. And so the the relation between sending time and and uh, standby time is uh, very in favor to the standby time. And um, it's also typical for these sensors; they are they can be uh, driven in in both directions. So that's why it is possible to have actuators as well, and it is possible to to control these sensors. Um, so there are several uh, sensors distributed in the area, which are all communicating with the LoRaWAN gateway. 
um, and this gateway collects all the sensor data and is connected to the internet as well uh, as you can see in the chart and from on the other side there is a dashboard or our different applications which can access these these data of these sensors and and uh, do analysis analysis on them so this is um, the example here in Geisenheim. Um, on the on the left side, you see all those sensors. These are the sensors already installed, but not yet LoRaWAN. So these are sensors you need to go there and um, uh, need to to get the data uh, in, in, in from the sensor directly. This means you you need to go to every sensor and and pull the data out of them. Uh, these sensors will be replaced by the LoRaWAN sensors and uh, two gateways are needed to cover all those sensors. And um, uh, some new fields or new areas will also be um, covered with these LoRaWAN sensors and you can see uh, you get a high, high, um, uh, res uh, high spatial resolution. If you have several, several areas, you can all uh, equip them with those sensors and with one um, LoRaWAN gateway, which will be positioned at the at the Department of Viticulture, you can cover all the uh, sensors in a circle of two and a half kilometers. So uh, these sensors are very interesting to to run uh, real time models for, for example, irrigation or irrigation scheduling or pest and disease control or uh, decision support tools, etc. It's also uh, very easy to share, share the data with project partners or, or uh, producers or services because it's all available via the Internet. So another activity um, is, uh, I call it here, multispectral and 3D measurements. So the, the LoRaWAN network, the sensor network, is more or less to get a lot of data, uh, I would say, um, around the plants, uh, climate data, soil data, air data. And the second activity is aiming uh, to, to look um, into the plants, kind of. So we have, um, uh, we are building a, a multispectral um, camera with 16 channels with a very high resolution, five megapixels each. Um, depending on the uh, on the distance to the target, uh, we can reach e even a couple of millimeter resolution. Um, uh, these these um, spectral bands are used to calculate or to verify or search for new indices. Uh, this is combined with uh, the, the 3D LiDAR scanner, uh, which has um, Anna already explained. Um, but this uh, LiDAR scanner will be uh, installed together with a multispectral camera on the drone. So we have uh, we can do frequent flights and have uh, high resolution high resolution 3D uh, point clouds, and this is combined as well with uh, photogrammetric um, procedures, which give um, better uh, optical uh, impressions. And so with with the combination of these sensors, uh, we can kind of look into the plants and and. Um, uh, find conclusions about their health uh, status or, or um, maybe uh, dry, dry stress or uh, diseases which, which are coming. Uh, there is also a, a hyperspectral camera available for deep insights if uh, something has to be examined uh, especially, especially exactly. Um, there are um, as well, um, high-performance uh, graphical processor units to combine all those uh, channels and all those data to get uh, data cubes. And this is uh, the aim is to do this online so that uh, during flight there is already a, a pre-processing of the data uh, to get uh, online information about the, the plants and canopy density and leaf area uh, of the canopy, etc. 
here on the bottom um, you can see the the available filters we we can we, we have for this uh, 16 channel uh, multispectral camera a uh, third activity is a uh, precision plant protection and fertilization so this is uh, some 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 ways in in common with uh, what uh, Anna told us um, there is a first first procedure. I call it a, the the offline procedure. So um, in the first step, the drone will fly with a, a simple uh, multispectral um, sensor. It's a five band sensor, the um, Altum. And um, after that, the the data will be evaluated, and there will be created uh, fertilization or, or um, plant protection maps, which are loaded uh, onto the drone. The drone is getting the the, the route to do the the specific uh, plant protection, and so this is a, a, an offline procedure. Uh, but it's previewed to do this online, as I've told, using this uh, sensor of activity of the second activity. Uh, so the sensor data are evaluated on board of the drone and uh, also decisions uh, on application rate um, um, are taken and the, the variability of the application rate can be realized with uh, either a spraying system with, uh, with, uh, which is adjustable in the, in the flow rate or pressure uh, or on, on the other, another method would be to change the speed of the drone. Here are some uh, some impressions of uh, of the aspects of the precision plant protection and fertilization as we understand it. Uh, on the left side here we have a filling station which is um, uh, which allows us to very precisely mix the plant protection agents and to uh, do the the transfer into the drone uh, also with exact quantities which are pre pre uh, pre setable. And uh, all this can be uh, contamination free for uh, as well environment as well as um, the user. Uh, on the right side, uh, you have uh, the the equipment on the drone. On, on the bottom here is uh, the spraying system controller. It's a system clever spray from uh, Inovel. Uh, uh, on the top top right corner here, you have a bigger image of the professional flow sensor and pressure sensor, which is used to to uh, get uh, specific uh, spray rates. And here uh, an impression of uh, uh, what is what is already done. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the um, the possibility the drone can be programmed to to uh, spray specific um, uh, parcels of of an area. Um, there above, uh, you can see the documentation. Here is uh, uh, everything carefully uh, documented: pressure, flow rates, uh, used used uh, agent. Uh, this is locked together with the position, as you can see here on on the downside. And uh, here you can even see uh, the, the when, when turning. Or changing row, the spray system is uh, switched off, and this is also uh, locked in in high resolution here. Here on the right side is a, um, a quick evaluation of the Altum sensor. You can see you can build different uh, indices, for example NDVI, as you can see here, uh, which can be used for the decisions uh, how to fertilize and how to do the, the plant protection. Another aspect of this precision uh, plant protection and fertilization uh, activity, this is especially done of the Department of um, Enology, um, is uh, to uh, they, uh, establish a, a sampling strategy uh, in a fertilization trial. Um, and they do they do uh, laboratory measurements. Uh, of nutrition uh, states and health states and do with a uh, with a spectrometer vehicle uh, do the measurements with a uh, with a spectrometer and 
uh, they, here is a, a kind of overlay. Um, we can see there's a good agreement between the the leaf uh, analyst of, between the analysis of of the leaves manually done and the sensor map done with the spectrometer vehicle. There is not everything uh, directly corresponding, but you can see that here uh, a very good a very good agreement of these of these um, areas. In these, uh, on this special area, also was done uh, one flight campaign um, with the with the drone. But this is not yet evaluated. It will be uh, interesting to see how this will correlate to the to the pictures we are, have here. Another aspect is there is an industry partner that would like to um, uh, show or tr try his his uh, precision fertilization sensor. This is a Isara uh, sensor. And uh, this is the outlook for 2021 um, to do a setup in the um, fertilis fertilization trial and compare with the, the results of this um, uh, ISARA sensor. A fourth uh, activity is the drone control um, to to increase the efficiency of the area capacity. What what can be done on one day? Uh, there are two two means to to increase this. Um, one thing is increasing the size of the drone. Another thing is to extend the possible reach region of operation. So this means operation in um, in, in BV loss uh, manner, uh, meaning beyond visual line of sight. And if a drone gets more heavy, it's more risky, and there are more requirements to to minimize the risk. Um, um, the same is for BV loss operation. So um, one thing under ALS is uh, the drone absolutely needs to be connected to air traffic uh, control. Um, this is realized in our case um, with a, a UTM, meaning a UAS traffic management, uh, which is operated by the Deutsche Flugsicherung. And there are two ways the data from the drone get into the uh, UTM or to the to the DFS. One is a hook-on device you see on the left side. This is a, uh, a device in size like a cigarette package, which can uh, receive FLARM and ADSB signals and has also a GPS sensor you can see and has a, a LTE connection. So this uh, device can receive and send those uh, aviation aviation signals and can send them via LTE to the um, UTM system of the DFS. And there is a second system, uh, they call it uh, GBSAS, a ground-based situational awareness system. This is uh, uh, a similar thing like the hook-on device, but uh, for a stational for a stational um, operation. This has a much more uh, much more uh, um, a bigger disc distance. It this can cover. Uh, this is also connected via internet to the uh, UAS traffic management, and this, these systems the uh, DFS is informed about um, what drone what is the drone doing what is the course of the drone and also there is a back channel um, the the uh, the drone operator can log into the uh, UTM system and can see what other aircrafts are uh, in the air around my region of operation Uh, this uh, this connection of the drone is extended by this uh, quite a bit complex um, graphic. Uh, as you can see uh, here in the middle, we have the drone. The drone uh, has a flight controller. On the drone is installed the hook-on device I described uh, before, and the hook-on device and the flight controller um, are connected to the internet via uh, mobile network, 3G or 4G. Uh, there is a, this is the, the remote control of the operator. In general, we also have a, a laptop near the operator for mission planning or getting uh, extended data about the drone, telemetry data. Telemetry data and remote data is going on this radio link. And um, now when we when we want to operate a drone beyond the visual line of sight, 
um, or when we operate the drone in areas where there is not really a good uh, mobile radio network coverage and you can see there is a problem because all those connections get lost and this is uh, the idea uh, we need um, additional radio links which are realized um, with two kinds of satellite communications there is one uh, based on iridium these are satellites uh, uh, circling around the earth the advantage of them is you can have uh, mobile antennas so there is a hybrid modem on the on the drone installed as well which is connected to the flight controller so it can transport data to um, via the iridium uh, satellites into the internet so there is the the link uh, re-established and this is a two-way communication the the utm system also can uh, give commands the back way to um, to to command the drone for example to land or to return to home there is another um, uh, satellite system this is a geostationary system uh, astra satellites are well known from television um, the advantage is a very high data rate and it's not that uh, expensive um, uh, but the disadvantage is uh, you need a, a, a ground station which shouldn't move that much so you have here this uh, this box and you place it somewhere and there are five minutes needed so this antenna is is um, standing up and is searching the satellite and and directing itself precisely to the satellite but uh, thereafter you shouldn't move it so this cannot be installed on a drone it's uh, also too heavy as you can see but the advantage is this uh, system is um, setting up a vlan hotspot and the flight controller and the operator's uh, personal computer are connected via VLAN to this uh, to this uh, satellite antenna, and so you have a quick or fast internet connection via satellite, even if you have no uh, mobile mobile um, coverage. So this is uh, necessary and sensible for autonomous flights and for, for drone tracking. And it's uh, quite a challenge to uh, realize the communication between all those systems. Uh, fifth uh, activity is, uh, I call it here, economy and interests of uh, consumers. So questions to be, uh, which are asked and to be answered are, is the, the use of drones economically reasonable? for fertilization and for uh, um, uh, plant protection for example um, it's a it's a challenge uh, it's, a, it's a question to estimate the, the possibilities of saving plant protection agents and fertilizer using the mentioned high quality sensor data and artificial uh, intelligence so um, um, it's a bit different from what what uh, Anna described. Here is the focus more on on um, not to distinguish between uh, trees and and uh, the, the the vineyard areas, but uh, to to difference to find the difference between uh, healthy areas and uh, unhealthy areas. So a related question is, uh, it would be nice if the helicopter could be replaced for plant protection. Uh, and for the consumers, um, this is uh, the, our third target group, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, is there a demand for, for precise production or for extended production documentation? And if, they, if the consumers say there is a demand, will the consumers really use the information or is it uh, kind of with, like with organic products, a lot of people say, oh, we would like it, but um, in reality, they, they, they won't buy them. So have we say some, some similar aspects here or not? And um, to, to answer this question, there is um, an, an, an extended online uh, webshop created uh, to test the, the uh, behavior of the consumers concerning these aspects. So for my conclusions, uh, as I've explained, it's a quite multidimensional project. Currently, the focus is still on the on the viticulture, but wheat and, and canola and orchards uh, trials are planned. 
a lot of the necessary preliminary work is done and uh, there are several cooperations with industrial partners which are really interested and are delivering uh, interesting uh, products and uh, the equipment acquisition is uh, finished for now and we are uh, really looking forward to 2021. So, um, for me, rest uh, saying to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, uh, yeah, uh, post them. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Dr. Brunner, for providing us with a detailed insight into the activities of DivaCopter. So, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Please go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Uh, what's about the permission you need for the copiers? Uh, is it really important that you have a redundance system using on one hand Astra and on the other hand Iridium? Um, the, the, um, this is a very broad uh, discussion topic. Uh, at the moment, it's all not yet clear how this will 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 come out. It's clear these are drones um, that are quite heavy. Most of them are more than 25 kilo. And um, we need to to look what what uh, can be what can be done to support or to minimize risks. And um, the the satellite link is um, is an additional an additional uh, security factor for one side and on the other side it's um, especially in in in, uh, in country country like regions there is often not a really good coverage of the of the uh, mobile network and if you lose the mobile network um, you lose everything and so this is uh, this is the trial to to find a backup for for uh, this. It's not only special, especially necessary for the drone. We are besides of that interested because we we have the impression this is quite an interesting system, completely independent of the drone. Um, if you if you operate uh, things where you would like to have internet, but there is no network coverage, you are lost. Uh, and with these satellite systems, which are um, not really that expensive, uh, there could be quite interesting applications. And so it's also uh, uh, a topic in the project. Is, is this technique usable? In the, yeah. mm -hmm. I understand that quite well, but give me just an idea about the um, uh, money you have to pay per one gigabyte using perhaps iridium, maybe it's a better way than to use 5G, or is it not true? Um, this is why I've explained both systems. Now the 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 bytes per the the, the payment per gigabyte for iridium is um, much more expensive than the bytes per the, the the payment per gigabyte for the for the Astra satellite. As far as I understood, in the in the Astra satellites, it uh, depends on the on the uh, on the on the agreements. There are even chances you can during the night hours uh, get data without paying. So it's uh, it's quite an interesting uh, quite an interesting thing. On the on the uh, iridium side, here is the advantage you can. Uh, yeah, you can have the modem on the drone. This is small and it doesn't need the, the precise direction. But uh, there is the payment more or less on kilobyte base. And so this is only interesting for uh, for uh, telemetry data of the drone, which are only some kilobytes per, per, per second or minute. Um, whereas with the Astra system, you can even think about transmis transmission of, of video or extended data from our, our uh, multispectral sensors. Thank you for the answer. I can see that Mr. Boban Illich from our partner standing working group um, in Macedonia also raised his hand. So please, um, you can ask your question. Mr. Okay. So thank you, Peggy. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. Yes, for organizing this uh, video, how can I say, 
workshop, chat, and presentations, and so on. Um, I'm not an ignorant one, or uh, I'm agronomist, and um, listening to these two presentations, practically I found myself like uh, a little bit very, very hard to to yeah to go through all these uh, abbreviations and so on. So I guess I have to update myself with the uh, yeah this modern vocabulary. Uh, first thing uh, I have noticed, and this is a general, uh, how can I say, uh, observation. I'm participating in uh, different global, so to say, discussions and uh, uh, regarding the digital tools within the, yeah, with the agriculture. And uh, what I, I was waiting the two presentations, so maybe I could wait a little bit more. No one is using the uh, how can I say the expression digital agriculture, digital viticulture, and I'm very glad to hear that because that is the kind of a new vocabulary within the, yeah, sometimes, you know, unexperienced people are talking about digital agriculture. For the moment, what we are here listening is uh, digital applications within the uh, different aspects of the viticulture. Consequently, other yeah, segments of agriculture, which is a, for me, it's a philosophical question because it is bringing some new technological, so to say, uh, solutions for certain problems in production, in traceability, in handling the. So that is the first thing, and uh, thank you for that, because uh, maybe this is maybe too far from this technical discussion, but. Again, you reconfirm the position, uh, uh, which also I personally believe it is true. We cannot talk about the digital ag agriculture or digital viticulture. Viticulture is a biological process, full stop. Digital tools within, how can I say, production are more than welcome. And uh, you just reconfirmed my uh, my opinion. Uh, my, maybe a question now. So this was a general comment. <laughs> Uh, question to how, for example, uh, okay, certain aspects of the first presentation are, uh, how can I say, are going into that precision agriculture, so to say, terminology and so on. How to apply the, uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, how to apply the, all these, uh, how can I say, technical solutions on a, a very small uh, plots, uh, such as in the Balkans, okay, we have a very small, uh, how can I say, plots. I don't know, in general, in agriculture, it is between one and two hectares uh, in principles. Uh, okay, I think in viticulture, they are even smaller. Mm -hmm. So, is there any limit? Uh, because precision agriculture, per se, cannot be applied on a, such a small plot without too, too uh, high costs. But please tell me in viticulture, how, how do you see the, the applicability of all these digital, let's say, solutions in the, in the area where the vineyards are uh, very, very small? I saw on the photos how it looks like, <coughs> but if you can maybe just give uh, additional explanation. Thank you once again, and uh, again, congratulations uh, to all of you who organized this discussion. Thank you, Boban. So can we already answer the question? Because I think it is really important because we, we are talking about research projects funded by the German ministry, but in the end it shall um, support producers, right? Um, so is there... Is there anybody willing to answer this or shall we go to the next presentation? Because then we will have the chance also to hear a producer's um, perspective on the projects. Maybe I can give you a short answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is because we, we are here in the east of Germany and we have uh, a very uh, small structure of hobby uh, viticulture specialists. And the problem now for all of them is they have to show up that they uh, have uh, the right knowledge in application of plant protection. And they have uh, to have uh, uh, enough time left to do that uh, during their normal jobs. And so I think in this case, it's very efficient to use the drone. 
and to, to use uh, the drone for plant protection because uh, you need just one person or two persons uh, being involved in the um, in, in the knowledge of plant protections uh, and you can't spray the wrong things normally and uh, it is um, economically quite quite uh, sensible to use the drone on even such small uh, limited uh, areas thank you Maybe I can give a small statement too. So the thing I um, I showed you about the uh, the the protection of non-target areas um, that can be done for also for the small vineyards for small for small areas because in Germany we also have only a few acres or a few few hundred uh, wines uh, and then they are like uh, segregated over a, a big area. So that is also a problem that we are facing, and uh, so that that web service will work with any kind any size of of uh, vineyard area so it could be one hectare or one acre so it would work with small ones too <laughs> i've just one question left the question is um if you take uh, for example the best time for plant protection it's during the night so the question is uh, have you any experience about the drone flying in the night or have you got already a permission to do that by the uh, authorities, because I think this will be the most important time for precision plant protecting. Um, we made, uh, but this is an, was another thing. We made uh, some trials by night because we uh, we made uh, examinations with uh, with uh, fluorescent colors in the in the in the spray liquid and um, uh, special lamps uh, which we switched on in the night and filmed this to see how the spray is uh, distributed uh, for the drone itself uh, the drone um, doesn't need to be uh, uh, seen uh, the, the mission of the drone is programmed into the drone and uh, the drone doesn't mind if it is uh, uh, night or day this is independent. Um, concerning permission, I'm not sure if there's really a difference. Um, at the moment, it's anyway quite difficult to say how will it continue with uh, new uh, EU regulations. There is a lot of discussion and not, not everything final at the moment. But for, drone, for the drone itself, it's, it doesn't matter if it, the drone doesn't need light to, to fly. And uh, another question might be uh, if you want to use the, the, the sensors I described, uh, they might be, uh, there might be a necessity for, for light. Because I'm not sure if, if, if there would be, one, one should think about uh, if it would be possible with the um, limited energy uh, on board of the drone to, to drive uh, strong lamps. Maybe this this would be uh, sufficient. I'm not not sure how how uh, what what performance would be needed of the light. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, as I said, we will have time for more discussion also at the end of the presentation. So for now, I would suggest to move on. Thanks um, again, Dr. Brunner. And now I invite uh, the representatives of the project Express, which is coordinated by the University of Leipzig but also includes um, the winery Schloss Proschwitz, which is presented um, through its general manager here. And I'm especially happy um, to welcome all three speakers. And I will start sharing the presentation now. And we can begin with, um, with Ingolf Römer. Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Um, Ingolf Römer, research group leader uh, in business informatics at the University of Leipzig. And I am the project manager of the Experimental Field Express, which is standing for Experimental Field for Data Driven Connectivity in Agriculture. We are particularly um, concerned with digitalization in fruit and wine growing. And uh, we are happy to show uh, a small part of the Express project in the next minute. Uh, so, Peggy, uh, you can uh, take the next uh, slide. Um, together with um, uh, the different agriculture stakeholders, we are creating 
a showcase for, for potential um, of integrated digital technologies. And that this is paying the way uh, for a sust sustainable and efficient crop protection. So we will see um, how it works on Winery Schloss Proschwitz um, in, in the end of our presentation. And um, one of the things we are dealing with uh, on the next slide, we see it, um, is um, the process automation, including, uh, including uh, semi-autonomous driving. Um, in this context, um, there's often a talk about five levels up to a full automation. So we see it um, in the um, middle of the uh, slide. And um, yeah, if we uh, is, uh, have a look at uh, stage null, uh, we see that that means the driver handles all, takes, uh, all tasks uh, manually. So this is uh, often state of the art in the wine yards, uh, also in the very small wine yards. Um, with um, operator in, uh, assistance, um, the machine assists the operator in driving or process control. Um, so we're going to stage one. Um, this is in any case the approach in wine and fruit growing. So we are working on the transition, of course, to uh, stage two, partition automation, which means or that means that the machine has the control of driving and uh, process in specific use case. But there are also some different things we have to look about. So on the next slide, we see um, how it works. Um, in stage null, we, uh, we see no automation. And uh, if we have a look um, on the different or the significant difference between um, stage two and stage three, um, on the one hand, the driver has to monitor the system and the environment constantly or can hand over the task to the machine, but still have the possibility to interrupt at any time. And this is the fact. So we have to be at the machine all the time. And um, yeah. From this level on, the legal uh, framework, especially in the EU and of course in Germany, needs to be clarified. What is happening in Germany and different working groups um, on national level and of course uh, by the ma manufacturers itself. And, and up to level five, we have different techniques um, which um, build in complex systems on the, on the tractors maybe or on the machines. Um, and on the next slide, we see how it works um, in our um, experimental field. So um, the stage always referred to a special use case. Um, we begin with a use case um, uh, using a spraying system, an overline with, with spraying system, recycling spraying system, see in the middle, uh, see in the middle of the page. And um, the application uh, case sketch uh, here, compromise a narrow track tractor equipped with a system for partitional automation. So we see it on the left side, um, the display for uh, from Topcon for um, um, semi-autonomous and also um, different systems on the um, uh, Samsung tablet and the, uh, over um, the um, uh, Topcon display, which is uh, for the recycling uh, system is recycling spraying system. So the convention costs for existing vehicle fleets are really kept within with reasonable limits. So we spoke about um, 20,000 euro per tractor. And um, so you can drive um, through the line um, in the Rhineyard crowd or in a fruit crowd. Um, crowd. And um, yeah. It allows uh, GPS controls recording of driving routes, saving and semi-automatic uh, driving of these routes in combination, maybe with an uh, overline recycling sprayer. Semi-autonomous uh, here means that the system takes over the steering for regulatory, regulatory reasons, accelerating and braking is done by humans. Yeah? This is the 
the fact in Germany. Um, the system keeps the tractor exactly in the middle of the driving line through the Rhine yard. <clears throat> and in the future, um, we will um, give a solution for slopping and slope um, while also following via hydraulic uh, connecting um, or controlled connecting between the spray system and the tractor because of uh, different um, um, different uh, 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 slopes on the countryside. So the driver considerably uh, relied while driving. That means um, that even unexpected drivers can manage difficult driving situations and also of particular interest is the transfer of experience gained in new combination of working processes. We see it on the uh, right side. Um, maybe we can uh, simultary use of a multi bed spreader, a deep loosener and understock treatment during one pass. Um, sensor controlled, of course, and adapted to the specific area. But we are currently also testing a predictive guidance system. Uh, see on the um, left, seen on the left side, uh, with a special leader technology, um, which allows to control the understock treatment automatically. But you couldn't um, uh, use the front of the tractor with this system. So this is also affect um, what we are testing or which we are testing. Yeah, in the coming uh, years, um, also field robots um, will also be used in the experimental field um, as carriers for camera systems as seen uh, on David's uh, presentations and um, with connection to the 5G infrastructure in Saxony um, as shown in state four um, in our slides. So our impression is that automation will only be successfully if it creates additional customer benefits. And all in all, demographic change and their relocation of skilled workers is supported by this automation. And uh, now Martin Cheek uh, will continue our presentation um, with the application of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Thank you. Um, Peggy, you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, yeah, my name is Martin Cheek, and um, I'm also um, working at the um, Business Information uh, System Institute of the University of Leipzig. And um, as we are um, a digital transformation institute, um, we have a look at uh, how these new digital technologies um, yeah, can be integrated in, in especially wineries in, in this project. And um, I want to give you a brief introduction to what is AR, VR technology, augmented and uh, virtual reality. So augmented reality um, makes it possible to enrich the real reality um, with um, yeah facts about um, identified objects. Um, I have seen through my maybe Google class, so through classes. Um, so I can um, yeah, um, see current climatic uh, conditions related to the position I am really at the moment um, through this class. And so um, maybe my feelings or my emotions um, become facts and I see them and can um, yeah, consider them in my, in my um, doings. Um, this is augmented reality. Uh, virtual reality, um, we see or we understand as a from the own current position. So the um, yeah, different existing environment um, can be traveled through VR classes or maybe um, a constructed or animated world can be immersed. So I, I yeah, dive into another reality. So from this um, yeah, um, emerging technology. Um, we have started an initial analysis and discussion with um, professional users and also agricultural consultants. Um, how these technology can be uh, integrated in in um, viticulture and horticulture also. 
And we identified three main points um, that we focus on in the project. And first of all, we see here an application in, in operational control. So, um, um, for example, employees can, in the field can be equipped with drones and, and uh, generate real-time um, view into the field. And um, using VR classes and, and field operations manager um, can also dive into the field from the office. So if necessary, he can also support the employee in the field um, with tips on working procedures and yeah, give tips in, in how to handle um, the actual situation. Uh, further application in, in work process control can be the visualization of sensor data uh, through the um, augmented reality class as mentioned before. So um, employees um, are, are shown um, historical or um, live data in the current row of binds and uh, so support um, decision making and yeah. Uh, yeah, get an optimized and improved impression of the current situation of the plants. Um, an, an overlapping live image and, and connected data from farm management systems, as we've heard um, um, before, Anna mentioned it, um, and also the maybe um, designed um, recommendations from, from different um, disease prognosis models. Um, can be put together in an, a digital twin, um, uh, so to to get um, better um, yeah recommendations in how to how to handle um, steps in the field. But um, one must admit that this will be rolled out um, in, in some months, maybe some years ago. So at the moment, uh, the main point is how to integrate data and um, yeah give the give the um, employees in the field a tool set um, with the hand to, to handle efficient. So a second um, application scenario um, we identified is uh, the, the creation of training scenario for tasks in outdoor operations. So while the, the first um, applications are real time in the field, the second part is um, for preparation and um, yeah, for training of, of employees. Um, there are two um, fields we are working on. Um, the, the first is, um, for example, with haptic feedback and full body tracking um, that can be used to um, identify unfavorable movements um, or to train even better movement uh, sequences of the employees in the field. And uh, here we can use data cloths with, um, uh, in, in, in horticulture, a short excourse. Um, in horticulture to touch an apple maybe and how to uh, how to harvest this um, with this data class. But also in, in viticulture um, you can um, prevent illness and posture damage in, um, through these um, yeah more conscious posture um, even right before you go into the field. Um, one the, the third application this is um yeah, away from these cultivation tasks, um, it's already being used in practice and especially driven by the current um, COVID-19 um, pandemic situation. So here producers are supported in sales and marketing um, uh, by the use of virtual reality classes. So this enables um, a virtual work through the vineyard. One can drive with a tractor through the why not and follow follow the whole development process, the production process of wine, and of course um, experience the the resulting product um, in a virtual wine tasting. So this is um, yeah a step to transparency in this production process, and uh, how these um, production process um, yeah uh, is is working in the in the Winery, I think um, Georg Prinz de Lippe will give us insights um, yeah, on these um, digitalization and digital transformation processes. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I tried to give you a, a little insight view in our wine estate. 
So my opinion, the most important point is to make the people working for a wine estate competent, to give them more ability to decide. And therefore, um, for example, the uh, automotive, uh, uh, the autonome or semi-autonome driving machine gives the opportunity for the man on the machine to look for more uh, equipment. So it's more efficient because he is not uh, forced to concentrate on the uh, steering. He is uh, forced uh, not uh, by the machine. So he can look in the in the wines. He can look uh, at the equipment. And so he can do a better job. Normally, the guy who is driving the uh, tractor is a well-educated uh, wine expert. And we um, yeah, transform him to a truck driver, which we don't want. So uh, in that case, we get uh, people, uh, they uh, have more uh, aim in their job uh, in the future. They will have more abilities to uh, prepare decisions in the wine estate and to increase the quality. So in our case, we have two tractors uh, driving uh, semi autonome and so we take the best driver and uh, we, um, uh, we take his driving data for all the others. And so the best driver drives uh, in the vineyard and uh, the man on the machine has the ability uh, to, to, to collect more information about uh, the situa situation of the wines and uh, of the uh, equipment we are using. The second point is we are, uh, we used here a near infrared, so multispectral cameras, as uh, the colleague from uh, Geisenheim um, already explained. We using uh, this uh, uh, wave uh, in between six and uh, ninety nanometers to decide whether the sanity of the wine is okay or we have a problem. Then we can use the same camera system on uh, both sides of the tractor. When the tractor goes through the rows, uh, we can get more information about that. And the third point is uh, the camera system, the 3D camera. This is a fantastic uh, help also, because normally if uh, I see a problem as a tractor driver or as a man working in the vineyard, uh, I will call uh, the general manager of the vineyard and he will come with the car to the place. Now he is really able to see what's going on there uh, on a virtual basis. On the other way, we can use uh, artificial intelligence to find out which disease we might have in the wines. Uh, we can uh, see uh, uh, what is uh, the general uh, situation in the wine and so on, and we can uh, by uh, artificial intelligence, we can uh, immediately find out which variety we have and uh, we can see ESCA, whatever. So that is a fantastic tool for us, step by step, to create more sustainability, to, to be more aware of the wines and the vineyards. And therefore, I think this is a great help for the future for all the wine growers in, in the world, not only in, in, in Germany, it's, I think, a good step forward. I thank you very much for your listening. Thanks a lot, also from our side. Sorry. <laughs> right at the moment. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation um, given by the three of you. So now I open the floor for discussion or feedback from the audience again. I have a question or a suggestion to Martin. Uh, I like the idea to have these gloves. And it, it, I think I know about the apple pickers in, in South Tyrol, in Alto Adige, that it is really, a, you have to concentrate because the, every apple is different. Some apples have some falls and they go into the juice production and the other ones are nicely packed and go into Japan or to Germany. So if you combine these gloves with some sensors like a camera 
or something uh, to look at and then it's blocked because the apple is not okay so the person who's maybe not perfectly trained in in the in the how an apple should look like this could be assisted or when we go to the hand picking with grapes you can see this much amount of 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 um botrytisized uh, uh, berries and then my 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 glove is is blocked and I can't use it and the other one would be fine because we have more and more workers in the vineyards which are not fully trained and they need this kind of an assistance. Yes, so this is really something we are focusing on and um, I guess this is um, combining two technologies. So the one is the data cloth with the feedback and the other is the, the, the augmented reality class um, that gives you the advice um, pick or not pick maybe. Okay. And, um, but I also must admit these data cloths um, we are using um, is the, is the um, low budget um, <laughs> uh, kind of, so starting from 5,000 euro. And what you are thinking of is um, blocking so that you cannot grab the apple. It starts um, at the moment at um, yeah, around um, 100,000 euro. So I'm quite <laughs> not sure if there's really the economic value. Okay. But I like the idea. <laughs> okay, any any more questions? Otherwise, I have one and it's quite straightforward. So what should a virtual wine tasting look like? I can imagine the virtual tour through the vineyards in seasons also, which are not uh, so nice to look at them and so on. But what's a virtual wine tasting? Come on. <laughs> Well, the virtual wine tasting, um, you can create your avatar and um, sit next to your friends while not sitting next to them. <laughs> so, but, but I would still have to have some wine to taste, right? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> of course, you, you will get um, a, um, um, five bottles of wine. Um, I guess the colleagues from the Fraunhofer um, Institute, um, uh, David, isn't it your institution, um, doing a virtual wine tasting today, I guess. <laughs> I think several people are doing this now in the Corona uh, time, yeah. but uh, but usually you get your your bottles of wine and then you watch a YouTube video or any video and and drink the wine and talk to them over a chat, for example, or something. Okay. But that that thing with the avatar would be like the next step. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then this is what we are still missing because we are also planning for some online wine tasting. But I was just curious what it's what else it could add <laughs> doing it with the express. But thanks. So looking at the time, I say we continue now with the last presentation again. Thanks to the three presenters. And I think we will have time again to discuss in the end. Um, but now I'm happy also to welcome Professor Dr. Ulrich Fischer because he is um, he will give us some insights on a topic that we have discussed within our project internal meetings, which is um, electronic documentation and management of production data. So also um, thinking about accompanying documents and so on. We that's what we already um, covered in our wine project in the Western Balkans. That's why I think it's very interesting. And at the same time, sorry, <laughs> at the same time, I'm um, also happy to welcome him because he's from the Institute for Viticulture and Enology um, from Neustadt, which is another, um, he will also give us some insight, which is a wine uh, training institute. And apart from Geisenheim, which we know very well within our um, project, it's nice to also give some more German um, German institutions the chance to talk. So, Professor Fischer, please go ahead. I guess you can see the presentation. Lee, you need to unmute you. We still can't hear anything, but I also can't see you. Wait a minute. Can you see, hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. First of all, I want to just thank all the, the, the speakers before. I learned quite a bit. That's very good if you are a speaker and you learn from the other colleagues. And the reason why I'm speaking at the last position is because we talked about the growing and the support of 
uh, artificial um, intelligence of drones, how to produce better and more efficient, more sustainable the grapes. But now we also want to market the wines. And I know that you are coming from other European uh, countries. You're very interested also in the German market. So it's good maybe for you to know how under which kind of circumstances we are producing here. Next slide, please. This is now a slide. Yeah, this is the Wein campus in Neustadt. So we are in the middle of the fields. We have different scientific or um, research institutes, but we're also happy to have our own wine estate with roughly 24 hectares where we can, we can do a lot of trials and, and research projects. And we offer three different academic um, uh, programs and a vocational school, uh, not only for winemaking and viticulture, but also for horticulture. Next slide, please. And here I show you some pictures of our meeting room where we meet with our clientele, with our uh, viticulturists. We have excellent um, analytical equipment, a very much used sensory room. And of course, we can do the trials directly in our own vineyards, like here defoliation trials or something about the crop management. Next slide. And that's the last slide of our introduction. This is our very modern experimental winemaking where we can do really precise red wine fermentations or um, white wine fermentations protected against any oxygen or with a temperature we really like to have. Now I would like to go on the next slide into our project and it's called Southwest because where you see the red circle um, in, in the map of German, you see it's really Rheinland-Pfalz, our state is in the southwest, but it's a small but a really nice state because it comprises about two-thirds of the German viticulture area, six different viticultural areas like the Mosel or the Pfalz, and so we have a very diverse uh, partners here who are involved in horticulture, in uh, apple growing in agriculture and of course in viticulture. But we also have some university uh, uh, in this uh, consortium, such as the Technical University in Kaiserslautern or the uh, University in Bingen or uh, in other places. Next slide. The core of all our nine experimental fields about four are about viticulture, the other ones agriculture, horticulture, and so on. It's about an infrastructure, and this infrastructure is um, about a knowledge platform we call Geobox. Geobox is um, state-run and facilitated source of data, and these data is coming either from a geosource data, which is officially freely available, like the site register where uh, which vineyards, erosion register, soil maps, site indices, and so on. Then we have a knowledge box where we have information about the water supply on the different soils, the topography, think about the steep slope vineyards at the Mosul or um, other aspects, the cultivars which are planted. We have every year different and for each producer different time dependent data the metrological data, the data about the phenological. So when is the bloom in this area, in this area, and this side? How about the diseases? We talked about it being very precise means I spray exactly at the right point, not too early. And next push of the, yes. And now this is freely available. Now it is very important that we have data which we do do which we do not want to share it's our own properties it's our own uh, information next uh, push of the button um about my wines i'm producing about the analytical results and here it is very important and this is a very strong conviction of our ministry is that these data belong to the farmer to the wine grower to the enologist and not maybe to a large company like um, a company making tractors or making pesticides or things like this. So this is important that this farm box is under the control of each individual winemaker, uh, grape grower or viticulturist. Next. 
And in this context of viticulture, next we are having four different projects. Next one, please. Um, one is about the optimum. Now go one back. I'm explaining the four fields here in viticulture. The experimental field number three is about optimization of logistics. Well, that's about, for example, what Anna was talking about. Um, we have a connection, for example, of the um, mechanical harvesters and the amount they are harvesting has to match the capabilities in my uh, grape reception in my, my pressing unit that um, not too much grapes are coming in, not too little. So this is about the optimization of logistics. I'm talking in more length about these digital forms. Then management of resources like energy, like water. Um, here we go in more than 50 different wine estates and wineries and cooperatives. And we've developed in a different project already a very easy way to measure at different sites inside the winery how much energy is used for this process, for this uh, machine and so on. And then uh, a colleague of mine is working on the digital management of cover crops. So you get information about the soil, about the water from the geo box, where you get information which are freely available. But then you're saying, well, I am an um, ecological wine grower, or I am doing this and this, and I would like to have. And then there is some uh, indication what kind of um, cover crop and what kind of mixture you should use. Okay, next slide. What are the objectives? We would like in our experimental field, we would like to establish a digital documentation system. You know, Europe is full of duties to document what you're doing. There are a lot of law people around who want to make sure that everything is per se. And that takes a lot of time. So we want to do it more in a digital, more optimized way. For example, the exchange between producers and recipients, one is selling wines, one is buying wines, and you transport it, this should be done much more simple. And uh, we would sample the data in the farm box, and then it's one push of a button, and then the forms are sent out. And our major goal is to relieve companies from the burden of bureaucracy. They should take their brain more to focus on new ideas, on more creative things to do. And the modular structure of our ideas and the geobox infrastructure that really ensures a nationwide application and I think this can be also applied outside of Germany in whole Europe. Next slide, please. So start first, bookkeeping at the grace reception and during the winemaking. The first thing is we have a vineyard register. Here we have the vineyard name in a database, the site area number, the cultivar, which rootstock it is grafted on, the year of the planting, and of course, the owner. So that defines where my grapes are coming from. Now I harvest the grapes, and now we're going through the process from pressing, fermenting, aging, and bottling. And here we have the wine register. And the first part of it is the harvest register, uh, where we enter in what is the juice number, the variety, the vintage. Very important is it a PGI, um, uh, a protected geographic indication or PDO, which is higher quality. How much grapes do I uh, pick? What is the graduation in degrees of sugar or the acidity? And what is the volume? And that's what I harvested. And now I make wine from it. And I also have to do my bookkeeping. What kind of enological measures did I do with this wine? Chaptalization, acidification, or the opposite, deacidification, fining, using chips, and so on. And so it's also for uh, the wine control, if they come into your wine estate, they know exactly where is the current tank. This Riesling is just stored at the moment. So that's what we are obliged to do. Next slide. Now, how can we do it more on a digital way? Because if you believe it or not, up to now, everything is put into by hand or we have a lack. We have some, of course, some software, but the softwares don't have the exit way to go, you know, for example, to the uh, Chamber of Agriculture to do this grape wine harvest declaration. And now in our module, we incorporate via the geo box, the site register information, the information of the vineyard register, 
and the information of the wine register, and then it's put together, and then it's sent by a push of a button. What is the reason behind why do we have to do this? Next slide or next push. Um, we have a prescription that we cannot produce more than a certain amount of grapes or juice on a hectare vineyards. For a PDO, it's 40,000 kilograms or 10,500 liters. For the PGI, the table, uh, the 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 um, Verde Pays, uh, it's more. And now it's very intelligent because we have on the one side we have the input. The input is how much grapes are harvested, and then when I for the PDO, I'm going to the next step and I want to market the wines. Then I tell how much bottles, how much volume I'm going to market. And then there is a comparison between how much did I harvest, how much did I market, and what is the amount of hectares. And then we can prove that we comply to the maximum yield per hectare prescription. Next slide. Now we do the application for the regulatory wine quality examination, which all the PDO wines have to go through. And roughly 90% of the wines in Germany are of this PDO quality of the highest level in the European pyramid. And beside of the vineyard information, where it's coming from the wine, about the wine register, what are the properties of the wine, we also have to feed in now analytical results from a wine laboratory, which is a private one or a state run one. So it's coming from outside. And here, again, we need certain interfaces to incorporate that and to make this digital uh, application possible. Next slide. That's how the analog form looks like. And what's blue, that's where we get the information from the internal data of the wine register. And what is green, we get the information from the vineyard register. And while this was very often done by hand or by a typewriter, we can do this now in the future digital. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So talking about now the application for the regulatory PDO uh, examination. Again, we have the data from our wine register. What is the variety? It's a Riesling, it is a dry wine, not a sweet, not a half dry wine, and so on. But we have also some prerequisites or some upper limits. So the wine is being sent to the wine laboratory, and then they do analytical results, and then they feed in, for example, what is the amount of alcohol? What is the amount of residual sugar? What is the amount of SO2? And here we have in Europe upper limits for certain wine styles, for example, 150 milligrams of, free, uh, of total SO2 for the red wines. And this is completed by the wine laboratory. Next step, please. And now this information is feeded by the internal wine register. What are the volumes behind? And now we bring the wine to the sensory evaluation part of the PDO. And this means that tasters, I will show you some slides of it, uh, they will check for typicality and for the no defect, for the absence of any defects. And this result, which means either, oh, everything's fine. No, it's not fine at all. The wine is not okay for commercialization. Yes, it would be okay if you do this and this further treatment, or you cannot sell it at the PDO. You have to downgrade it to the PGI. This information is bring, brought back to the wine grower, and then he knows, the wine uh, producers, what the result is. Next slide, please. So who, how, how this is organized. Um, the state of Rheinland-Pfalz, again, two-thirds of the German wine producer, has assigned the Chamber of Agriculture with the implementation of this official quality system. And the first thing what they do, they approve, they check private and state laboratories if they do their job okay, if the data we are coming from them, they are trustworthy and correct. Then they are checking for the formal and analytical requirements for the potential PDO, such as that the levels of total SO2 is below the legal limits. And then they do the sensor evaluation, which is different to many other European countries, 
done. And I think that's a very good strength that we always check on a sensory level. Good, next slide. And this whole system was implemented in 1971 with, uh, at this time, new German wine law. We are now implementing the next step of a new German wine law. But in 1971, this idea of a PDO was newly defined. And every year they check for 120,000 wines per year. Some of them represent 500 liters, others represent 500,000 liters. They check for the information on the origin, on the sensory claim. They look for the analytical compliance. They do the sensory compliance to guarantee that all the wines we are marketing are free of any sensory defects. And they are typical for the variety from the area they're coming through for the style of wine. For example, a rosé wine is different than the Blanc de Noir. And who is doing this? This examination is done by experts viticulture, enology, research, consulting, and so on, even some well-trained consumers. And that you can understand a little bit, I show you some pictures of this sensor evaluation in the next slide. Here, a colleague of mine who is a consultant for, Vit uh, for enology, he's testing here some rosé wines, they are blindly poured, and they use a very simple system from zero to five, numbers five is the best, above 1.5, you are allowed to market the wine. Next slide. Here, another place in Württemberg where they are tasting, and it's always three people who are tasting together. It's not one single opinion, it's opinion of three colleagues. Next slide. Good, now we finished the wines and now to market it. And most of the wines we're producing, we're not selling directly from our wine estate or from the cooperative. No, we are transporting them and we are selling them to uh, people out in the marketplace, to wine sailors, to, to, to uh, supermarkets. So we are transporting wine within Germany, but we are also transporting within Europe and beyond Europe within the world. And for that, we need trading documents national trading documents and international trading documents. And if you believe it or not, they are still done in paper form. And this is a lot of work, not only for the people who have to fill in these forms, but also the people who have to control these forms. If you believe it or not, there are people sitting in the ministry who are crunching numbers, who are putting in the numbers from a piece of paper into a database and then it's digital. And of course, we would like to help this. Next slide. So whenever grapes are sold from the producer to maybe a wine estate who need some more grapes than they produce by themselves, or I sell some wine to a winery who is making, bottling the export wine and bringing it to the export. Whenever a wine is transported from the seller to a buyer, I need these trading documents, and it's one copy for the seller, one copy for the buyer, or a copy for the commissioner who facilitated this business, one copy for the transport company, one copy for the wine register at the Chamber of Agriculture, one copy of the wine control. And you can imagine that this is a lot of work and this does not fit into our time. And with our solution, next push, uh, we want to make it available on our smartphones, on our uh, tablets, um, so that it's one push of the button and then all the five or six recipients have these documents and this is really digital. Next slide. Here, an example of these still analog paper form, which is can be feeded then mainly by our internal wine register. So we have the digital data, we just have to find this interface. Next slide. And this is the international slide, looks very much the same. Okay, I would like to conclude at the end. Uh, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve for our viticulturists, our winemakers, a one button, button digital solution for these three major required form and documents where they interact with authorities, with other partners, with laboratories together and uh, that this can be read electronically, but also as a PDF. We want to feed them with external and internal sources via the farm box, and we need some interfaces 
that's a little bit tricky, but we're on a good way on this. And finally, the winemakers have a full documentation inside and control of the output of the data with confirmation by the recipients. So we at the producers, the masters, we are the uh, authorities of our data. We don't give them out freely. It's just when we want to give them uh, further uh, along the road. Yes, bookkeeper and control authorities have then access to the digital forms, no paper forms anymore, no manual number crunching, no transcription errors, and of course, no time delays. Next slide. And you will question yourself, what are the benefits for me sitting in a different country than Germany? First of all, Europe has very much the same rules about some of these documents and the harmonization is getting further and further. But I think the German PDO system is quite interesting and unique in Europe because we have this sensory assessment of all marketed PDO wines. And at least 30, 40 years ago, it was very important that the winemakers learned about the new, about the quality requirements from the market. And so this sensory assessment was a very important tool to bring the wine quality up to the level where we are at the moment. When we can link the grape and wine yield report, so the input of grapes, juice and wine, with the approval to market the PDO wines, so the output of the wines, we allow precise bookkeeping and we can control the compliance of the maximum yield prescription. And this maximum yield prescription are true in many other European countries, I think in all of them to, at different levels. And I think this helps quite a bit. And for us, it's very important that the Geobox is providing all the official data, all the freely available data in one unit. And then the farm box is really collecting your private data, your data of your product, and you have a control what's going out from the farm box. And I think this can be used also in the future for many other administration tasks within the framework of national duties or European obligations. And very important, we want to decrease the burden of manually done administrative tasks in a very fast digital solution. And people will have extra time for private purpose, but also to creative freedom for everybody and everywhere. And that's the advantage of, of digital solutions it's relatively easy to implement at other places as well. And that's what we have in mind. Well, next slide and last slide. Now you have a picture of the beautiful Pfalz here where we're working and living, uh, Anna as well. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to entertain some questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for this presentation and for giving hope that part of the bureaucracy at least will be reduced with the help of digital solutions. So I see there's already one question by Bikim. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Peggy. First of all, uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Fisher. It's really perfect presentation. I'm really satisfied to hear uh, such uh, good things. Exactly what we do in the project, definitely uh, a lot of good issue, a lot of issue what we achieve some of the country. I, I mean, this is the main objective of the, our project, if I'm right, maybe. It's mm -hmm. really interesting also to see in practical issue the, uh, because it was planned for this year to see some of the issue related to accompanying wine register, wine control it. Definitely, I don't have a question because this is something which we, we would like to achieve all of the country, especially our ministry, because I didn't present myself, uh, Bekim Hoja, I'm coming from the ministry, acting secretary general, but I am part of working group. I'm really, really uh, fascinated with uh, this kind of, of, of uh, presentation from Mr. Fisher, definitely. Uh, I saw some of the issue also our country need to do to finalize and to have a, such a uh, good uh, system for the all issue related to the viticulture and wine control. Thank you. 
May I? And, and I'm excited that there are people in your group who are very interested in the experimental fields is about making new connections, inviting other people to work together. And I'm happy that we met now and we keep in contact that when we have the first solutions, we see how much we can transfer to you. That's a good thing. This is funded by the ministry. It's German European money and we all uh, profit from it, benefit from it to have a better progress. Thank you. Uh, just to add something, uh, once again, uh, when we started to work with the wine register, we get it uh, examples from the Germany because some of the experts through the GIZ, we get it, we started, but still we didn't finish. Some of the issue, especially like experimental fields, uh, wine laboratory, uh, wine cataster, uh, wine register, uh, controlling wine, we we uh, we achieve, but I saw some of the issue. What we need definitely to fulfill, we need uh, maybe more, 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 more details to to finalize and to establish full system of the functioning. Once again, thank you very much. Thanks, Bekim, also for the positive feedback already at this point. Um, I see that Lutz van Elk is also raising his hand. Hello, Peggy. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Peggy, and the speakers for organizing the meeting and uh, sharing all the information. Uh, well, with the, with the digital gloves, the meaning of um, handmade will, will change. But um, from my perspective, not only uh, this will change, digitalization will change the world. And therefore, I recommend to look on the potential of digitalization, not on the obstacles, but on the potential and uh, get familiar with it uh, as soon as possible. Um, well, in, in Germany, the German wine sector is in a, in a very good position at the moment, but well, th this might change. And um, we have to face that we are um, far behind the top of the world. Uh, look at the infrastructure, infrastructure. look at the application. Uh, just let me say Tesla or, uh, or Silicon Valley. We are far behind uh, this. Um, and um, I think we will get a new standard, and the standard will will be above the the standard we've got now. And if the, the sector is not using the di digitalization, they will, for example, Professor Fisher explained it quite very well. They will drown in a documentation. But if you turn it around, then you can the digitalization can help the sector to keep up with all the new um let me say the new the new standard for higher food standards standard for higher quality higher uh, food safety standards um and uh, so i'm very thankful that that you that you managed to to organize the, the meeting and uh, congratulations thank you very much peggy thanks a lot and as I said in the beginning, now is the time for any questions that you still have to any of our presenters. They are all still with us and I would encourage you to take this opportunity. And in case it's not a direct question, of course, you're also welcome to share some feedback with us at this moment. Yes, Bikim. I see that there are still, I mean, everybody is still with us who started in the beginning, which is also a very positive result <laughs> that everybody is, sticks with us for two hours now. And I know it's quite late, especially uh, in China, as we have some, some participants from China as well today. And it was a long day, I guess, for all of you. But again, um, if you would like to say something, um, to ask any questions, please feel free to do so now. Mila. Okay, I will keep you in mind, uh, Professor Fischer, but Miele, please go ahead. We cannot hear you because you're still muted. Sorry, 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 no, obviously, uh, old professor. So I will, I will thank all of you. Thank you very much for, for the beautiful, beautiful uh, afternoon. 
and all, all those nice presentations, which were, I would say, uh, fascinating. They were fantastic, I would say. Uh, some of them even this science fiction for, 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 from Bosnian point of view. So, and I'm especially especially thankful uh, for Professor Fisher and uh, uh, very, very, very nice hints in short presentation, very concrete, but uh, some very useful hints, uh, as you know, uh, those you guys from the project here in Bosnia, we should establish these uh, wine registers, accompanying documents, uh, infrastructure, and uh, very, very useful. Even uh, as much as I understood, uh, they are still working there uh, on developing this system, and uh, it's uh, on the way. But uh, uh, from our point of view, we don't have anything or almost anything. So <laughs> at least uh, we would try to to take all good, good, good hints. Uh, uh, I found on this uh, this presentation. So thank you very much again. Thanks, Mila. So Professor Fischer, you wanted to say something. The excellent talk of David from from Geisenham um, was very technical, and I learned quite a bit. But I just wanted to do put it a little bit in, also into perspective. I grew up at the Mosul with the steep slopes, and I worked at least in one year as an apprentice in this vineyard. And I see that more and more of the steep slopes in Europe are not used for winemaking anymore because we don't have the labor anymore, or it's too laborsome. We don't get the necessary amount of money for it. And I think these uh, drones and um, if, if they can carry enough of the of, of the spraying agents or of the fertilizers. We can really work on these small terraces, on this, on the very steep uh, slopes, regardless if we are in the Douro Valley, if we are at the Mosul, or if we are in Alto Adige or other places in Europe. And I think this may 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 be a help to maintain these very old tradition vineyards where people, our ancestors, made wine from, which are part of the story of our uh, cultural product. And I think here meets a new technology with uh, these tradition of, of, of steep slope vineyards. And I see hopefully a lot of potential. Hopefully they can carry enough load that this is all feasible to do. Thanks a lot for pointing that out and reminding me of uh, something I learned this year when talking to an economist in wine. And they told me that um, steep slopes will actually only survive on postcards, but not in, in real life because they are not, um, not viable from a financial point of view. And if uh, new techniques are giving us the chance to preserve them, <laughs> I totally agree with you. That is, that is wonderful. Okay, I also have one question from a from a project management point of view because that's my role I, I have here. Um, so what is the duration of the experimental fields projects? And I don't know if it's the same for all of you, so you can also answer um, individually. And also what is like, I mean, we've seen what you are doing, but how far can you get if you would imagine um, being now at the end point, which I don't know when it is, but you will tell me shortly. So what have you developed until then? And also, what can we, um, thinking of all the stakeholders in the wine making process, what can they make out of that? Just give us some, some vision for the future. And maybe we can start uh, in the order that the presenters presented today. So Anna, I would ask you first, what's the duration of DigiWine? And uh, give us a, it can also be a quite um, optimistic vision, but what's what's achieved in the end? What can you deliver <laughs> for the wine world? <laughs> well, hopefully uh, we will have achieved uh, some interfaces that we are working currently on. So the interfaces between the machines and the uh, software applications. Um, so that would be a, a much uh, big goal for me. And I would appreciate it if uh, if uh, the this interfaces and the applications in the farm management systems are going to be used by the wine growers effectively by the end of the project. So and, and when yeah. <laughs> when is that? <laughs> well, uh, as as the concepts are, are running and I think they will be put into place by end of the project, so, so that should be in two years tops. Well, not all of them, but for sure mm -hmm. some of them will be in practice and use. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Pona, 
How about DivaCopter? Uh, the DivaCopter project is uh, running uh, another two years. Uh, maybe there might be a chance to to get a, um, to to make it longer. We'll see. Um, we hope we hope that the the drone techniques can be uh, um, more established and that the the regulations get more clear and how the the conditions can be fulfilled to to operate the drone uh, for service service. Uh, companies or something um, we hope and it's our aim to to have um, to to uh, add um, or just to, to support the the aim of um, saving of plant protection agents which is mm -hmm. a which is a national aim and we hope this uh, will be a good uh, a good part we we can uh, deliver uh, especially uh, thinking on these uh, on these good sensors looking kind of into the plant and um, we hope so combined even with uh, artificial, artificial intelligence which would, will be able to to uh, not only look into the plant with the sensor but also with the with with uh, with the past information mm -hmm. so this this combination uh, seems really interesting and we hope uh, we will see good progress in this regard Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now I'm asking the colleagues here in Leipzig, what, until when does the Express project actually run and what will be the product in the end that you can see um, applied in practice? I mean, I know it's already tested in practice, but really for more than, than just those yeah. uh, participating in the project. Yeah, yeah, the field will also run at least of uh, until of, um, August of 2023, 20, and we will show a different solution. So we will see a solution for data integration in the clouds, um, blockchain solution, solutions for the tractors and drones, and hopefully we will make a valuable contribution um, to a sustainable crop production. And uh, in February uh, next year, we will begin or we will start a roadshow under corona condition with a small uh, laboratory, mobile laboratory um, to go uh, to the farmers and um, they can um, experience and try out solution uh, directly on the farm and discuss with us. Um, and uh, yeah, we will um, choose different things from the market and we'll try out uh, how good it works and um, what uh, is the best solution for each um, farm um, in the in the field? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. You you're nodding, <laughs> or you want to add? Them? Yeah, and uh, let me add something to uh, Mila. So um, as this is um, science fiction for you, it's also really cutting edge for us and um, also for the farmers. Um, so we will see how they will um, yeah, accept and adopt these technologies um, um, to their working. Mm -hmm. Thank you for encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and I would also, I'm also interested to hear from the only winery that we have present today, um, from Professor Britz Solippe. So what's your idea? What, where will the application be in 2023 on your wine? I, I think it's all about man. So you have to, not to persuade, you have to, to show the people in the estate that it's useful, that is uh, giving plus uh, information that is giving plus uh, uh, education and so on. So I think the most important point is the transform from the ideas we got out of the process or out of the express project uh, to bring them into the people of the estate. This will be our most important point. Uh, we had the experience when we started the first uh, autonome driving tractor last, uh, some let's say four months ago, five months ago, uh, there was a like a big wall, yeah. Nobody wanted to have it, yeah. Now they accepted it and they are training it and uh, they like it. And so I think persuading and uh, convincing the people is the most important point. And I think each project should always have the man 
in focus because the man is the most important point. We are still uh, not in an artificial world. We are in real world. We are with real plants out in the vineyards. And uh, so what we need is artificial help to make uh, our work better. And I think we are on a very, very good step forward. And our experience together, let's say, with the intellectuals from the university was fantastic. Thank you very much to both of you. It was a great uh, work uh, in the last month and uh, last year. Thank you very much. And all to you, thank you very much for your activities, for your forward looking and uh, the colleagues from uh, the Balkan area. Uh, I like your region very much. I've been there a little bit uh, around and uh, you have great potential. Use your potential and don't make you crazy about what we are talking about. It will come step by step. And so keep quiet. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks very much, uh, also for the encouraging words to our colleagues. And I also believe that believe that you know the the term of leapfrogging. There's also some some value in not following all the steps that we have followed here in our system, especially thinking of the bureaucracy. I think there's huge potential not to start with all the five copies of each document, <laughs> but with implementing a better system um, right now. Okay, but then um, if you don't mind, I have still one question left for Professor Fisher. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me uh, how you get all these data streams into your geo uh, in your geo box. I, I think we have a lot of uh, management managing programs for the vineyards, uh, wine yards. We have a lot of uh, management programs for the seller. How how do you intend to put all these data streams together? <sighs> Prince von Lippe, I'm pretty happy that I'm not in charge of this work. Um, uh, this interface discussions is, is really a problem, but we hope that we are such a strong uh, development because all our DLRs, all our other, we're working on that. So that the small, very often it's a small uh, producers or small software um, uh, companies, they, they need to provide us an interface and I'm very happy that we work with the uh, Chamber of Agriculture together, not the Chapskammer. They are also pretty strong and very much interested, very good. So together, I think everybody will see it's for the benefit of us all. And so I think this will make the, yeah, the connection of the di different data streams much more easy. Um, maybe if I proceed, um, we are starting the lease. So it's we, we have to stop in February 2023. And um, I'm pretty positive that we can do what we have, uh, we, what we want to achieve. We are programming at the moment, not us, but partners who are programming this, following our needs. And we hope to land, launch in the next half year, uh, no, in, in the second half of next year, the program. And then we want to teach um, our, uh, yeah, those people who want to use it. And the good thing about it, um, it, it's available then for everybody and not only for the pioneers of digitalization like Schloss Proschwitz, for example, but it will be available for everybody. And maybe compared to other talks, what we are doing is not rocket science. We are doing uh, something more manual, but it, it's very high acceptance of everybody because I think people will, will, will see immediately the benefit because no paperwork anymore and more control on, on my laptop, on my on my handheld um, uh, smartphone, what's going on. And that's our, yeah, I hope we can achieve this then. Thanks a lot. And I see that Boban Illich is, wants to say something again. So please go ahead. Thank you, Peggy. Um, OK, so about the impressions, I, I I would like to exaggerate and um, but also would like to uh, express my yeah full satisfaction of today discussion and uh, especially the last uh, presentation practically as also Becky mentioned fits within our project so to say um, you can say tasks and um, okay much clearer how and what we need to do I would propose that uh, the very moment we we can meet in person, 
I would like that with uh, dark or with baking immediately. We just see the um, how can I say the system, especially the accompanying documents, how it may work in German uh, how can I say conditions and try to make the how can I say Balkan version of it. Okay. Mm -hmm which will be even more complicated because, you know, you still have to deal with in uh, Germany with your lender, but in the Balkans there are independent countries, everybody has uh, its own language, so it will be it will be quite some challenge, but I think with a quite some political will, which we hope we, we have within this project, we can do that. Another thing, uh, just for the for the and because I, I really have to leave and uh, uh, great thanks from the Balkan side. And I know how big effort it was for 10 Germans speaking to around 10 Balkan people, all of that in English. So it was an effort and it is appreciated. I, I really do appreciate that. If we from the Balkans have to break our tongue, you just don't have to. So uh, great thanks. and. Um, it is really appreciated. I, I, I really would like to, to to confirm that and to reconfirm that even in person when we meet that uh, it was, uh, that is just the, the impression from today's discussion. So uh, Peggy, good job, colleagues, everything's fine. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a perfect uh, discussion and I saw most of the experts from the Balkan uh, participated, maybe not lively, but I think every one of them can maybe, I hope, share my impression. So thanks again. Thank you very much also for the warm words. And that is also, I know that not everybody could participate. And this is the reason why we decided to record this um, presentation today. So we will inform everybody in the Regional Expert Advisory Working Group on where they can find also the video of the presentations. So it will be available also afterwards. Okay, so is there anything to add? Anybody from the um, audience who wants to say something or also from the speakers? One more chance for all of you. If not, um, I think after seeing the presentations, um, I hope that the silence from some of our audience means that they are still digesting the information and <laughs> trying to dig into the, let's call it science fiction or whatever, what they heard of, because I think it is quite um, quite moving forward and not so, so I'm also not so used to this kind of perspective, but I, I enjoyed it very much and I hope for everybody who participated and stayed with us till the end, you feel the same. Um, I think it um, it really well demonstrated what's currently done in research um, in viticulture from many different perspectives. The projects they have some links in between, but at the same time they are very different in what they are looking at in detail. And yes, I I'm really happy. I want to thank all the speakers of today for the effort they put into their presentations and for giving us such valuable information. And at the same time, also to our colleagues from the Western Balkans, but also from the other areas that decided to take their time um, to listen to us. And I hope it was a pleasure for you as well. I feel very happy with today and um, I hope that's the same for you. Thanks a lot. And in case there is some question coming up um, in the aftermath of today, feel free to contact me. I can also provide the contacts to the speakers and to, yes, we know our project is going on until at least December 2021, maybe one more year. So I think we can um, maybe also incorporate some of the information and some of the contacts we have created now for our own project. And if we get the chance next year to come to visit Germany, I think there's already now some points added to the wish list of our participants from the Western Balkans of what they would like to see also in person. And now I'm seeing that Bekim is raising his hand again. So please feel free. To add. Uh, I don't have the question. Sorry for interruption. Just uh, uh, one request, please. Can you distribute it all to the presentation from the presenter? Because uh, 
really we have to learn a lot of issue from uh, their, their presentation. Please. Yeah. Sure, we will um, upload the presentations to the Moodle course as usual. And I will also inform you where we will put the video of today's um, event. Once again, thank you very much for the really great, great uh, presentation and, and organization from your side. Congratulations. Yes. Okay, anything else? Some last words? Otherwise, it's me. So again, thanks a lot. I'm I'm very happy, and I, it was quite a process, um, as always, to get here. But I think it's. I know that you. It was kind of. I was pursuing all of you to take this time, <laughs> and I'm really happy that we did it and that you stick with me till the end. So many things. Have a nice evening, and enjoy the end of this year, and maybe see you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Peggy. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank bye, -bye. you. Bye. Adio. Ciao.